everyone. This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We have another really fascinating story for you today and some wonderful people to help us tell it. Uh, let me welcome back to the program, Deborah Bonani. She is a retired senior NSA officer, was the executive director at NSA before her retirement. And I'm very pleased to say is now a board member of AFIO. Uh, to help me co-host uh, uh, this session, please welcome back Deborah Bonani. Thank you very much, Jim. It's really a pleasure today to be able to interview Jason Fagoni um, about his splendid biography of Elizabeth Smith Friedman. The name of the book is The Woman Who Smashed Codes, a true story of love, spies, and the unlikely heroine who outwitted America's enemies. Jason is a reporter with the San Francisco Chronicle. He's written for the New York Times, as well as many other prestigious and notable magazines and journals. And he's a graduate of, journal, from, of, of Penn State uh, in, in journalism. And it's so really, it's a welcome, Jason. It's wonderful to be able to have you today. Many of our listeners are probably quite familiar with Elizabeth's husband, William Friedman. Um, William is considered in many, in many, to many people to be the father of American cryptology, um, as well as the father of what is today the National Security Agency. Um, but his wife, Elizabeth, was quite a code breaker herself and has re really had a very notable, notable career. I wonder if we could start by, by uh, having you tell us when you first learned of Elizabeth Friedman and what motivated you, Jason, to write this book. Sure. Um, well, I... I, I basically just started uh, reading her letters. And as soon as I started reading her letters, um, her diaries and some of her original code worksheets, I, I just had this, this kind of sudden realization that, you know, this is, this is the greatest American that no one has ever heard of. Um, I was completely taken with her uh, on the page and everything that she did because it was, such a, it was such a wildly adventurous and unexpected career that she had. I mean, this was a woman who, uh, in her 20s, uh, started from nothing. She was not a mathematician. She had no formal uh, math training at all. She was a poet uh, who had studied uh, Tennyson and Shakespeare in college. And yet, uh, in the space of about a year, at age 23, she became one of the greatest uh, code breakers in the entire country. Um, not only that, she helped to invent a new science of American code breaking, again, in her early 20s, um, during World War I, she broke military messages in World War I. She, she used these skills that she learned uh, to confront the evils of her time. Um, not just in World War I, um, you know, during Prohibition, she used it to catch gangsters. And then in World War II, uh, the most secret part of her, her life and her career, uh, she used her code-breaking abilities to go after uh, Nazi spies who were spreading in South America. And so, um, you know, it was a story of a um, of kind of a hidden woman uh, at, at the heart of a lot of the the big diligence battles in the 20th century. Um, she shaped the century and, um, and all of this was, was essentially secret uh, uh, for decades after she died. It was something that I had never heard of and um, uh, that nobody had ever heard of. And so it just became, you know, when I started to uncover this uh, from reading her letters and her papers, I, um, I just thought, well, this is, this is too good of a story to, uh, to let sit. I have to try to tell this. And so, I, I, I became obsessed with it and spent uh, the next three years trying to uh, learn everything about her and to get the story out into the world. Well, it's a splendid book. Um, let's explore now a little bit about those, what I'll call the three phases of her um, of her career that you've just outlined. Um, I was taken with the, with the start of the book. She's 23 yeah. years old. It's 1916. And she goes into a library in Chicago uh, to get a glimpse of what she believes the library has just acquired, a, a new, uh, a first edition of a Shakespeare play. And while she's in there, uh, she meets up with an eccentric millionaire who asks her to go with him to a place called Riverbank. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about who was this man that she went with? Um, what is Riverbank? And what, if anything, does Shakespeare have to do with the beginning of her career? Yeah, that's a great setup. I mean, these are all these are all very intriguing questions, right? Um, uh, and this is the part of the story that is, you know, stranger than fiction. When you when you read about it, you think uh, that American history can't possibly have happened this way. It's it's too weird, um, but but it's actually actually true in every word. So um, so yes, there was an eccentric, wealthy millionaire, uh, a textile merchant from Chicago named George Fabian. Um, he was he was a little bit off. He was he was a little bit crazy, maybe. Um, 
but he had a ton of money. And unlike um, other wealthy men of his era, uh, people like Carnegie or Hearst, uh, George Fabian didn't like to spend his money on fancy uh, French paintings or, or lavish vacations. He was obsessed with science. He, he believed that if he threw enough money at basic scientific research, then he could help to unlock the secrets of nature and make major scientific advances. He was, he was particularly obsessed um, with a, this idea that there were hidden messages embedded in the works of Shakespeare. Um, in particular, he thought that there were secret messages that were hidden in this very rare book that was held at this um, private library in Chicago, or a copy of it was. The 1623 uh, Shakespeare first folio, the first time that Shakespeare's plays were all put together in one book. Um, you know, there were there were a, a couple of hundred copies of this that had survived down the years. Uh, the Newberry Library happened to have one. And um, Elizabeth Smith, you know, she, she was she was just 23 at the time. Uh, she she went to the library, went to Chicago looking for a job. Um, she was a school teacher. She hated her job. She wanted something more adventurous. And through this chance encounter at the library, she happened to meet this guy, uh, Fabian, this this wealthy uh, multimillionaire. And um, he, he came to the library. I found out she was there, um, that she knew something about Shakespeare. He pulled up in this limousine and walked right up to her. You know, he's a large guy. He was six foot four, like 240 pounds, like giant beard. She'd never seen him before. She was 23, very petite from a small town in Indiana, he came right up to her and he said, uh, would you like to come out uh, to Riverbank and spend the night with me? And this is a very uh, scandalous thing to say to, to a young woman. And so she just sort of stammered that she didn't know. Um, she didn't have her pajamas or a toothbrush or something. He said, oh, don't mind that. Come with me. And that was the start of Elizabeth Smith's uh, code-breaking career because um, she'd never heard of Riverbank, had no idea what it was, but it turned out that Riverbank was... Um, George Fabian's. It was kind of a a cross between a um, a, a rich man's uh, a country estate and a mad scientist's laboratory. He had turned this 350 acre estate that he called Riverbank outside of Chicago uh, on the Illinois Prairie. He had turned it into a, a world class scientific laboratory. And one of his most important projects was trying to find these secret messages in Shakespeare. For that, he knew people who knew about. He needed people who knew about poetry. Um, and he needed people who knew about codes and ciphers. Elizabeth knew about poetry. She didn't know anything about codes and ciphers, but um, she was young and ambitious and she agreed to uh, go to work for him. And uh, that's where everything kind of started for her. So she meets, she also meets William there. Can you talk a little bit about what is he doing at Riverbank? Right, so, so this is kind of a classic American story. Two people from very different worlds uh, uh, are brought together through a chance encounter. They fall in love. Uh, their families don't really want them to be together, but they um, they click on such a level that their you know their love kind of overcomes these difficulties. William uh, was another one of these young people that George Fabian had just kind of thrown money at a scientist and lured him out to the prairie, um, telling him that he could pursue his scientific uh, dreams. William was a uh, plant geneticist from a Jewish family in Pittsburgh, and. Uh, he was at Riverbank. He was supposed to be sort of crossbreeding different kinds of uh, crops to create uh, new kinds of, you know, new kinds of crops, new kinds of uh, strains of corn, that sort of thing. But um, he had to be handy with a camera. And because he was handy with a camera, he got roped into the Shakespeare project because a, lo a lot of it depended on taking uh, photographs of the Shakespeare first folio and enlarging them um, to be able to see the fine details. And so he had, because he had a dark room and a camera, um, he got roped into this. And because he got roped into the Shakespeare project, and because that's what Elizabeth Smith was working on, the two of them uh, started to spend a lot of time together. And so they met and very quickly uh, uh, fell in love. And it wasn't just that they, you know, they loved talking to each other. It's that they they were working together, um, you know, solving these puzzles and and sort of beginning this 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 incredible uh, partnership. Uh, in code breaking that would that would carry them um, carry them through the you know through the decades um, they would sit across from each other at a table and uh, and burn through these puzzles and they found that you know it wasn't just that when they were working together they were twice as good it was like they were 10 times as good it was when they were working together um, uh, uh, breaking codes it was like they had had superpowers it was just something something about their minds just uh, uh, just clicked and and one of the things that um, 
that first got me really interested in the project is that some of the first letters that I read were love letters between Elizabeth and William. Um, and sometimes they would sign off the love letters to each other by, by writing in code, um, which, I, which I thought really spoke to their the strength of their connection and, um, and how, you know, early on in their lives, it was all tied up with this uh, sort of venture that they were embarking on around uh, codes and ciphers and code breaking. So World War I, in some ways, uh, frees them from looking for patterns and codes in Shakespeare and moves them more in a direction of, of national security. Could you talk a little bit about that? Right. So, um, so in 1917, America entered World War I, and all of a sudden, this kind of offbeat Shakespeare project acquired a, a sudden military urgency. Um, because at the time, there, there was no national security agency, right? Um, there, there were very few uh, trained code breakers in America at all in 1917. Elizabeth used to say that you could count them on the fingers of one hand. So there was no NSA, no CIA, and the FBI was very young and it didn't have any code breakers. The army didn't even really have any code breakers. So for the first eight months of World War I, uh, the U.S. government needed to read the messages of the enemy. It had no ability to do that. The only people who were really prepared to do that were these kind of crazy Shakespeare people out in the Illinois prairie. And so as strange as this sounds, uh, again, uh, truth is stranger than fiction, uh, for the first eight months of the war, uh, these these Shakespeare code breakers in Illinois uh, at Riverbank uh, solved all all of the U.S. military's messages, uh, not just for the military, but for Department of Justice, too. And so that's really that's really where the NSA begins. You know, the as you know, Deborah, like the, the traditional history of the NSA is not very dramatic. Right. It's sort of, you know, founded after World War Two to kind of consolidate all of these um, uh, all of these code breaking sort of advances that were made uh, during the war at various agencies, get them all, get people all in one place, sort of build on that. Not a dramatic story, but the, um, but the actual sort of prehistory of the NSA is, is, is a very dramatic story because it, it really begins um, with Elizabeth and William and these other, you know, Shakespeare experts um, out in Illinois, sort of roped into the war and doing this stuff, inventing under pressure. It, it was really invention under pressure. So, they were thrown into this all of a sudden. Um, you know, Elizabeth was 23, 24, William uh, uh, just a year older. And all of a sudden they're, they're breaking uh, uh, codes for military states. And, uh, and a lot of them, a really high volume of messages were being sent out to Riverbank from Washington, D.C. And so under pressure, they, they started to invent new methods of, of breaking codes. And this is how Elizabeth and William you know, in the space of a couple of years, um, started to publish some of their techniques that, you know, went on to become the foundation of good code breaking practice for, you know, for the next half a century in America. So, and Elizabeth at the time was not credited. We can talk about this if you want. She wasn't credited with um, being a co-author of, of some of these papers and some of these advances. Um, but when you go back and you look at the the archives, uh, go back and look at the documents, you can see her writing and, and her name all, all over the stuff. Well, after World War I, um, William stays in the what I'll call the national security side of, of things. Um, but Elizabeth makes a bit of a transition. She is assigned to the Coast Guard, which I guess at the time in the late 20s, early 30s was responsible for, for patrolling American waters for uh, uh, drug smugglers and rum runners during the the, the during prohibition, um, and she has a pretty notorious uh, career here, and she and she brings down some pretty notorious criminals, I should say. Um, can you talk a little bit about this sort of law enforcement um, phase of her career and the tremendous role she plays in prosecuting some fairly significant um, criminal the, the criminal element? Sure. Yeah, this, this is this is a wildly uh, dramatic period of her life, right? Um, more dramatic than she would have liked, I think. So, um, so in 1925, uh, you know, she and William had left Riverbank. They were they were in Washington D.C. William was working for the Army, and Elizabeth at, at that point had dropped out of code breaking. She she wasn't uh, she wasn't with the government at all. She wanted to write children's books, and she was raising a young daughter, but. Um, the fact is she was just too good at code breaking to be left alone. And um, this thing started to happen to her that would happen throughout her career that she sometimes complained about, which is men from the government keep showing up on my doorstep asking me to solve puzzles for America. And they, they, they won't leave unless I solve these puzzles and give them back to them. But every time I do, they just come back with more puzzles. Um, 
she 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 was just too good uh, for the government not to bring her in. So so the Treasury Department's big challenge at that time, the Coast Guard, they were they were trying to go after these rum runners, uh, these criminal gangs that were smuggling liquor on the high seas, had gotten very good at it. Um, the rum runners had. And they had a lot of money, so they were able to hire uh, very experienced cryptographers to protect their radio communications with very strong codes. And so the Coast Guard couldn't read anything that, that any of the radio traffic that these uh, rum runners were using. So they needed a code breaker, and they brought in Elizabeth. And she became, uh, for the next 10 years, uh, 12 years, she became the Treasury Department's uh, secret weapon. Um, she would uh, she would take these intercepted messages. She would uh, break the codes. She would uh, decrypt them, and she would stack the plain text in a pile, give them to the Treasury Department, the Coast Guard, and then the Coast Guard would be able to go out and arrest these guys because all of a sudden they would know where the boats were. They would know the names of the captains. They would know their routes. Elizabeth wasn't just uh, breaking codes and solving individual messages during this time. She actually figured out how to use code breaking and these and these intercepted messages to develop an entirely new um, and powerful system of counterintelligence. So so she was really she was really doing this sort of big picture intelligence work of of um, sort of gleaning information from these intercepted and broken messages and figuring out how to light up this entire kind of hidden, darkened criminal underworld that was operating on the seas. And um, these were some very dangerous characters. You know, my impression of Rum Runners before doing this book was that they were kind of gentlemen, you know, basically nice guys who were just kind of out for the kick of it. Uh, in fact, the uh, the Rum Runners were were controlled by mafias and criminal gangs. Um, you know, this is the era of Al Capone, right? So, so Elizabeth uh, was going after these guys, and it wasn't just that she could sit at a desk, you know, in the Coast Guard and go after them. She had to appear in public because um, when she would intercept these messages and decrypt them and and figure out, you know, where the where the boats were uh, sailing and then the guys would get arrested, the government will, would want to make a case against them, try them in court. But the, the key evidence was the uh, intercepted and broken messages that Elizabeth provided. And um, they couldn't get a conviction unless Elizabeth actually went into the courtroom in person and explained to a jury exactly how she had broken the codes. And so you had this incredible spectacle that happened over and over starting in the early 1930s where you would have a, you know, a packed courtroom um, with, with some of the you know, foremost gangsters of the era uh, sitting at the defense table. And, you know, into the courtroom would walk Elizabeth Friedman, who was, you know, a five foot three mother of two at that point, you know, in a pink dress with a, you know, a pink hat and a flower pinned to the brim. And she would walk in, up to the witness stand and, uh, and she would be sworn in. And then she would proceed to sort of face down, you know, some of these, some of these gangsters. Um, and she would explain very calmly to a jury exactly how she had defeated them. Um, you know, risking risking her life uh, in, in the course of doing that. She had to be protected by U.S. Marshals. Um, because she got death threats, and um, and another byproduct of that was that she 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 became for a brief time a front page newspaper story. She was called uh, the pretty little woman who protects the United States. Uh, she absolutely hated that, as you can imagine, C couldn't couldn't stand it. Um, and uh, I mean, I even found a, a a story that was written about her in um, in one magazine that called her the Lady Manhunter. I mean, she she was. She was a she was a story for a while, um, and as much as she as much as she disliked the attention, uh, you know, it was it was kind of an inherently inherently dramatic thing, and it was irresistible for newspaper reporters. Well, she was breaking these codes also um, in 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 languages that she could not speak. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so she understood. She was a she she was not. Um, she was not fluent in any other language, as far as I know. Um, she she could read a little bit of French and German, um, but um, you know, as you know, co code breaking the the sort of the craft and the science of code breaking is depends on a deeper understanding of of language that goes beyond vocabulary. It's um, it's it's trying to understand the the relationships between uh, letters and groups of letters in a language. So you're working at, at, at the level of the individual letters and relationships between letters and other letters around them. Um, it goes beyond goes beyond vocabulary, goes beyond 
parameter, really. It's, it's, it's something that's deeper. And so, um, you know, Elizabeth and William had taught themselves, trained themselves to deconstruct language at, at, at that deeper level. And because they were able to do that, um, you know, they didn't need to be a fluent in a language to break messages in that language. You know, they did work with uh, translators, um, certainly in World War II, uh, Elizabeth had a very talented uh, translator that worked with her in the Coast Guard to to help to translate um, a lot of German messages, but um, but she she could really do a lot of it on her own because she 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 understood uh, the patterns of language at that deeper level, and she was even able to uh, to decrypt uh, messages sent by uh, opium and heroin smuggling gangs that were operating in uh, in China. You know, she 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 could. Uh, fairly effortlessly crack messages, you know, uh, in Mandarin, which which was amazing to you know to newspaper readers at the time, and you know she was she was she was praised, uh, and was sort of an object of of wonder in these stories because she was able to do it. But um, she always explained that you know this is just this is just the science. Uh, this is the science of code breaking, and um, and and it's and it's very very powerful. <laughs> Well, let's turn to World War II. Certainly, by the outbreak of World War II, Elizabeth uh, and William are, are are have tremendous reputations in cryptology. Um, William is off doing all sorts of things with the army and with with the military. One of the things, of course, he helps to do is is break the Japanese purple encryption system. Right. But Elizabeth is really focused on South America and the Nazis. Uh, uh, intrusion, if you will, into uh, into South America. I wonder if you could talk about that. Sure. So this was kind of the most surprising um, thing that I learned uh, while researching Elizabeth and her, and her career. This was a, a piece of the war that I had never heard anything about before. Um, so at, at the start of World War II, uh, Germany began sending spies into South America. And they sent these guys in with clandestine radio equipment, and uh, you know these spies would land in uh, in Rio uh, or in Buenos Aires, and they would set up these radio sets, and they would start to transmit radio messages back to Berlin and Hamburg, you know, over these clandestine airwaves, um, you know, protecting the messages with uh, with you know strong systems of codes, and. Um, you know what were they? What were they talking to Berlin and Hamburg about? They were watching Allied ships in various ports, tracking them, and sometimes sending the coordinates of Allied uh, ships back to Germany so that Germany could, um, you know, tell U-boats to go and, and try to sink them, which which happened again and again. Um, you know, they were also trying to get um, any information about the Allied war, war machine um, that that they could, anything that could hurt the Allies and help help their. Uh, help their masters in Germany, they, they would send over these uh, clandestine radio nets. So, um, and South America was actually a, um, a fairly fertile territory for Germany to try to spread influence because there were a lot of uh, native Germans who had, had immigrated there, were living there. Uh, and there were a number of um, sort of native uh, fascist or fascist style political movements in individual South American countries that that had kind of a natural affinity with Nazism. And so um, there were people in U.S. government, including FDR, um, certainly J. Edgar Hoover, who were very worried about uh, Germany spreading its influence in South America. And uh, it became a goal of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI to try to go into South America, find these Nazi spies, arrest them, and eliminate these uh, Nazi spy rings operating there. The problem was uh, the FBI couldn't do it. Jagger Hoover had no code breaking team. He didn't employ code breakers. Uh, all he really had was this technical laboratory, which was like a crime lab that could um, analyze fingerprints. So Jagger Hoover was forced to rely on somebody who did have the ability to to break break codes and listen to radio uh, networks and find out what spies were doing. And that happened to be Elizabeth Friedman in the Coast Guard, and and essentially they had been doing that since 1925 already. You know everything that they did with the rum runners, you know, uh, intercepting these radio messages, breaking the codes, um, gathering intelligence, figuring out who the leaders were, finding their names, the names of their, of their ships, they're mapping their routes, essentially lighting up this whole darkened, uh, underworld. That's exactly what she had to do in world war II, um, with these Nazi spies who were operating in South America. And, and so she used, was able to use the same basic techniques, um, 
to to find these Nazi spies, figure out their code names, who they were working with, um, and feed all of that information to Allied intelligence. Um, and ultimately, she she and the Coast Guard were successful at uh, at doing the secret mission for Jagger Hoover. They 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 uh, they smashed these spy rings. They found out who everybody was, and um, law enforcement was able to go in and um, and uh, round them up, arrest them, eliminate this dangerous threat. And then after the war, uh, you know, Jagger Hoover took credit for it all, uh, as as he was wont to do. Um, you know, there, there, I, 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 you, both of you know, there, there are infinite stories about Hoover's FBI sort of taking credit for the uh, investigative work of other intelligence agencies, law enforcement agencies. And this is, this is a particularly um, agreed, egregious example, I think. You know, after the war, Jagger Hoover um, uh, went public and he said the FBI uh, took down these dangerous Nazi spy rings in South America and, and you're welcome, America. Um, and uh, Elizabeth was unable to say anything because she didn't have the power and uh, because all of her records have been marked secret. So this is a big reason why, you know, Elizabeth's story has been has been untold, has been hidden for so long. It's because um, it wasn't just that her records were secret for decades, which they were. It's, it's also that, you know, uh, Jagger Hoover maneuvered to uh, to kind of erase her from history. So so one of my goals with the book was was to try to correct that, to try to try to bring out the, the, the true history of that of that piece of the war and um, give Elizabeth uh, give Elizabeth her due. So, Jason, as I read this book, um, I was really struck with the the influence that Elizabeth had on William. And yeah, yeah. Um, in some ways, I come away from the book believing that he may not have been as successful as he was without her. And I say that for two reasons. One, because first, she was a true partner, intellectually his equal. Um, so she understood the stresses and the challenges of his work. And even though during World War II, they did not really talk about what they were both doing, that they were each doing because of the classification and secrecy, but she understood the challenges he was under. And I think he probably un understood hers as well. Um, but in addition to that, she was serving as a, a, a empathetic caregiver to him because he suffered from some very significant um, depression. I guess today we might call it clinical depression. So he right. had quite a, 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 some serious episodes of of mental illness, uh, particularly during the World War II uh, years. Um, is that assessment of of my saying that he may not have been what we all know him to be had it not been for her as his intellectual partner um, and his caretaker? Is that is that uh, an yeah. accurate assessment? I think that's true, and I think that's very perceptive. Um, I mean, I think from from the beginning, William always saw the two of them as a team. I mean, you know, when he was writing letters, he would call them the Friedman combination. And you know, William and Elizabeth they they invented um, you know a lot of their a lot of their methods together. You know, they they were co-authors on some of the Riverbank publications. You know, they 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 worked um, at the same table for years at Riverbank uh, solving messages. And, and as they went to, to work for different parts of the government, you know, their paths kind of diverged. Um, but William still relied on Elizabeth, um, you know, over the years and increasingly as as he got sicker for for uh, emotional support. I mean, there was there was this piece of a letter that I quote in the book that where he tries to describe to her, you know, the, the, the effect that, that she had on him. So I'm just going to quote it for you. I've known, this is William writing uh, right before World War II, writing to Elizabeth and trying to tell her what, what she meant to him. I've known for a long time that you are the one in back of me and responsible for what little I've done. Had it not been for you, I'd have been sunk long ago by unsolved infernal conflicts, by windy storms of emotion, by failure to keep up the fight when things seem not worthwhile. I know how much I owe to you for love, for wisdom, for courage, and common sense. I mean, I, I think he saw her as, as kind of a rock um, and someone that he, that he needed to be who he was. And certainly, you know, throughout World War II and after the war, as his, um, as his illness worsened, he needed to rely on her more and more. You know, there, there's a there's a beautiful and, and sad story um, 
that I talk about in the book where, you know, William, uh, when he was working at the agency uh, toward the end, there were some days when he was, um, when he was so depressed that he, he could not get out of bed. And, um, on those days, Elizabeth would, would get him up, get him prepared, uh, would take him, take him to work, would walk in, into his office with him, would sit at his desk and he would still be immobile and unable to begin work until she took her hand, put it on his hand and helped him to move, begin to move his pencil on a piece of paper. And only then could he, could he start to work. And there was just something, something about that, that anecdote uh, was, was so lovely to me. Um, because it, it just spoke of that, of that connection that was forged in their youth and that really survived um, pretty much all of their lives. They needed each other. And, um, you know, to the extent that the book is, the book is, is sad. It's, it's that there, are, there were times when they weren't able to be as supportive to each other as they might otherwise have been because they were working for different parts of the government and they had to, uh, they, they couldn't connect because of secrecy regulations. So, um, but I always saw them, I always saw them the way that they saw themselves as, as, as kind of a unit, uh, as William said, the Friedman combination. I think that's one of the most, um, one of the most beautiful things about their story. It is a beautiful part of the book, I have to say. And it, it, it um, I wish all those years I, I sat in the Friedman Auditorium and all those years I, I knew a great deal about William Friedman. Um, I do wish I had, I had uh, known about her, her contributions. I have a lot of young women who I mentor and, um, I'm I'm recommending this book to all of them who Oh, that's who, great. because I think it's just it's, it's it's a wonderful love story but it also is just a wonderful um uh, dramatization of a, a tremendous intellectual partnership so I I love that part of it. Oh, I'm so uh, glad to hear that. Thank you. So we'll end with just asking you may have gone into this book with some assumptions about about cryptology maybe about the intelligence community um, did, how did the book change those assumptions negatively or positively or, or what, what, what's been the effect of the book on you? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I feel like I, I had absorbed, uh, absorbed information about some of these intelligence agencies and their history. I, I, I think, I think the, the actual history of how they developed is much stranger <laughs> than, than I ever knew. Um, uh, you know, a lot of what, a lot of what I, learned about their development I learned through Elizabeth and William you know they were kind of my my teachers uh, you know the most the most surprising thing uh to me diving deeply into Elizabeth's story is that you know there's this there was this woman behind you know a lot of these key moments in the in the development of American intelligence in the 20th century I mean she put her stamp on you know not just not just NSA but also on FBI uh even on CIA um and so I through Elizabeth I got a very kind of tactile and textured sense of, you know, how, how these, how these massive powerful agencies were, were kind of born um, and how much of a mad scramble it was at, at the very beginning, you know, even to the extent that, um, I mean, these agencies were, were initially led or created by very chauvinist men, but uh, you know, some of them had such, such little grasp of, of the basics of, of cryptology that they, they were willing to go to a woman <laughs> to Elizabeth and, and ask for her help and, and bring her in, um, because they needed her. So, um, so that was, that was striking to me. And I, I also think I got, uh, I got a, a very textured sense of how, how some of these intelligence agencies, um, you know, went astray, uh, over the years as, as they developed and grew more powerful, um, you know, how they became overconfident or, um, or became overly secretive, um, you know, you, you can you can see when you when you read the letters of Elizabeth and William in the you know in the 1950s and 1960s, you can see them becoming skeptical about the the massive growth of the NSA. Um, you know about something that William called the secrecy virus. Um, he he and Elizabeth were you know were were very worried about uh, uh, sort of what they saw trends in the intelligence community, gathering too much information, keeping too much of it secret. Um, you know, they worried about uh, the effects on democracy. And so, you know, I, 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 I learned, I learned about, um, you know, some of those trends by, by reading Elizabeth and William talking about it to each other. Some of the things that they were worried about, um, you know, I, I really, I really felt like, like they were kind of teaching me about, uh, you know, 
about the history of these agencies uh, at, at, a, at a pretty deep level, because by by looking at them and, and their life, you can you can see uh, you can see these much bigger um, bigger sort of historical uh, uh, things unfold, and that, that was part of the fun of of doing the book is that um, you know. I, it's just a very sort of textured way to to look at these at these stories that we think we know, but we uh, we don't know them well enough. Well, Jason, on behalf of all the women from NSA uh, and all the women who've done cryptology over the years, I'm going to thank you for this book because it has just been it's just marvelous. I recommend it uh, highly, um, and it's really been a pleasure to be able to spend a little bit of time with you today. Um, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thank you so much, Deborah. I really enjoyed talking to you. They're they're wonderful questions. Uh, thank thanks to you. Thank thanks, Jim. Thanks thanks to uh, Afio. I really appreciate uh, you doing this. Jim, we will we'll send it back to you now. Well, this has been uh, just a marvelous story about a couple of real American patriots and heroes uh, during the 20th century. Um, wonderfully well told by Jason in his book, The Woman Who Smashed Codes. I want to thank Jason. And never for uh, just a great interview. I know our viewers will really enjoy it. Thanks very much. 